name is Alan Hayline, and I'm the director of the Regional Faith Group that's sponsoring tonight's event. So I want to just say a, a few words about that and then introduce our speaker. And at the end, we're going to also talk about a group called Discovery Institute and have someone come up and talk a bit about that at the very end. We are going to do some Q&A, so um, think about questions during the talk that you might want to ask Dr. Dembski at the end. We don't have a handheld mic for that, unfortunately. Anyway, so Regional Faith is a group that uh, we meet every week at the same time, every Thursday night when school's in session. People off campus are welcome to attend, and it's a group that looks at the evidence for God from science and philosophy, looks at arguments for God, and then also looks at historical arguments related to the truth of Christianity. So we're a Christian group, we make a case for the truth of Christianity, but we try to interact with objections from the other side. We have non-Christians that attend. And so we're, um, is that really, ooh, we're getting some feedback, aren't we? Yeah. I don't know if there's another microphone on or something. We'll see if it's a problem when Dr. Dembski is up here and, and maybe adjust some knobs. Anyway, uh, you are welcome to join our future meetings. We're starting a four point science series. Uh, for for part science series. Um, so yeah, I'd like to introduce now our speaker, Dr. William Dembski, and he is a noted mathematician and philosopher, so we're very thankful to be able to have him come here. Uh, he's the founding senior fellow of Discovery Institute, the group I mentioned earlier. They have a, a center for science and culture that we're going to talk, uh, talk about later. But Dr. Dempsey's taught at Northwestern University, University of Notre Dame, and the University of Dallas, as well as several seminaries. Is that, that's really getting bad feedback, isn't it? Mm. It's not too bad? Yeah. Maybe it's worse up here. Okay, good. Um, so one interesting thing about Dr. Dempsey, he's one of those folks that has like more degrees than a thermometer, you could say. <laughs> so he, he has a, two doctorates, one in philosophy, one in math. He also has multiple master's degrees, including statistics, and interestingly, a uh, Master of Divinity from um, uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. So that's pretty cool. He's held several National Science uh, Foundation graduate and postdoc fellowships, and he's published articles in math and philosophy, uh, and is the author or editor of over 20 books, including one that's coming out soon, uh, second edition of the Design Inference, a well-known book that he'll talk briefly about, I think, that's um, really a seminal work in the intelligent design movement in terms of getting it, its mathematical underpinnings. Uh, Dr. Dempsey's work has been cited in three front page stories in the New York Times, as well as the Time Magazine cover story on intelligent design. So we're very pleased to uh, have Dr. Dempsey come and speak. Okay. Well, uh, I've got a lot of material to cover, so hold on to your seats. So, let me give an outline of the lecture. I want to uh, define intelligent design, motivate it, give an overview of some special sciences that fall under intelligent design, because it's often questioned whether intelligent design is even science. So I want to suggest to you that it is. Spotlight how intelligent design looms large over biology, that you really can't avoid it. Show why Darwin cannot rule out intelligent design from biology. So you can't just get rid of it by the stroke of a pen. But then I want to also challenge that Darwin provided a better explanation of biological origins than intelligent design. Sketch on how we detect and infer design or intelligent agency. Define the key intelligence metrics, specify complexity, and then 
what is this all mean? Why is it important? So let's get started. So to define intelligent design, what is intelligent design? And the definition I put to you is intelligent design is the study of patterns in nature that are best explained as a product of intelligence. And so the key word there is patterns. So there are patterns. I need to speak louder? Yeah, can you speak a little louder? Just a little louder. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I just I want to yeah. stay in that range where, you know, where we don't go get into the feedback loop. Okay, so patterns best explained as a product of intelligence. So a pattern like this, a cloud formation, nothing there that would suggest to you intelligence. This, on the other hand, would. What about these trees in the forest? naturally produced, no pattern that would suggest intelligence. What about this? Uh, Hitler youth, after or to the close of World War II, decided to plant some different trees among the regular evergreens, which then would change color. Uh, one might argue that this could have happened naturally. If those seeds just happened to fall, boom, that's how it happened. But nobody accepts that, right? So is intelligent design testable? If you're convinced that, I'm sorry, if you're convinced that this is not the product of chance or natural forces, but product of intelligence, then I would put it to you that it is testable. Um, is this rock formation best explained as the product of intelligence? Well, it turns out this was actually Mount Rushmore before it was carved. Uh, that's what it looks like now. And I would say, there is a clear mark of intelligence there. There's a pattern there that would tell us that it is the product of design. A uh, little known fact, it's a little <laughs> share that with you. So, all right, moving right along. Okay, so, <laughs> so what is intelligent design? The study of patterns in nature best explained as the product of intelligence. But patterns, you know, patterns, forms, information, we could also say that there's a study of information in nature that is best explained as the product of intelligence. And we'll touch on that theme and idea of information more later. Okay, so next point then, overview of few special sciences that fall under intelligent design. Special sciences as opposed to the fundamental science of physics, so economics, even chemistry, biology, uh, things that are sciences on their own right and not reducible to physics in any clear way. Uh, so what would that be? So what would be included under there? Well, forensic science, that would certainly count. A uh, very interesting case actually in the last uh, month or two that finally came uh, to head. Uh, this is Mark Tessier-Levine, uh, former president of Stanford University. He was discovered to have committed data falsification over a period of 20 years. 12 articles now have to be retracted or uh, radically revised. Um, he ended up resigning effective August 31st. Interestingly, the person who finally blew the whistle on him was an undergraduate, Theo Baker, not just an undergrad, a freshman at Stanford, <laughs> who retracted down and showed that he was uh, indeed guilty of data falsification. So what was the key thing that convinced uh, people? There was a big law firm in Chicago that ended up doing the review. Well, this was the firm, Kirkland and Ellis. And this was what was one of the many incriminating things. So here you have some scatter diagrams, whatever you want to call them that were supposed to be from two experiments, and they're identical. So if you're doing experiments, separate experiments, you've got separate random forces coming into play, you should not expect to see the same error distributions. As Aristotle put it, you can go right in only one way, but if you go, but you can go wrong in many ways. And when you go wrong in exactly the same way, there's a pattern that's matched. It's a coincidence. You cannot explain that as a consequence of chance. So these sorts of patterns convicted uh, Mark Tessier-Levine, and uh, he is no longer president at Stanford. So this is this is this has real-world consequences, uh, and you know it's 
there, there is design detection that's going on here. Uh, another special science, archaeology, is that an arrowhead isn't just a random chunk of rock. You know, we pose these questions. Is it the result of natural causes? Is it the result of intelligence? Uh, so arrowheads. Is that a burial mound or is it just a naturally formed mound? Did these rocks just arrange themselves randomly or is there intelligence behind it? Uh, I had to put this one in. If, if you've seen this is Spinal Tap, you'll know what this is, but we'll always just ignore it. <laughs> the famous Stonehenge scene. Anyway, uh, so archaeology. Now you might say, well, the intelligence in these cases is entirely human, but uh, it doesn't have to be limited to humans. What about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence? So uh, Carl Sagan wrote a book called Contact. It was a very popular movie back in the late 90s, uh, starring Jodie Foster. Uh, and uh, so what you have there, this is not like the UFOs that are currently making the news. Right? UFOs, the big selling point there is that the little green guys are coming to Earth and we've got, you know, we see them, we see what they're doing. With SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we have signals that are coming to us from outer space, like electromagnetic signals of the same sort that we produce ourselves. So what is it about a signal that would convince us that we're dealing with an alien intelligence, okay? But the fact is, SETI takes us beyond just things like forensic science where we're identifying human intelligences. Okay, let's move on. So let's spotlight now how intelligent design looms large over biology. It's one thing to say that there are these special sciences out there where intelligent design is real and is something you have to come to terms with. What about in biology itself? This is the sticking point. You know, I wrote a book called The Design Inference. I had a very nice job prospect at the time in the late 90s when I wrote it. It was published by Cambridge University Press, very prestigious press. Uh, is being looked at by schools like Princeton and uh, Notre Dame. Uh, all of that ended very quickly for me after I made it clear that I thought these ideas had applicability in biology. So uh, is that unreasonable to think that these methods of design detection, that intelligent design might be real in biology? Well, you don't have to talk to intelligent design proponents to see that design, intelligent design is at least in the background is something that you have to deal with. So for instance, Richard Dawkins, page one of The Blind Watchmaker, will write, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. That's page one of The Blind Watchmaker. Then he takes another 310 pages to explain why it is merely an appearance of purpose, why there's actually no actual design there. Francis Crick, Nobel laureate, the late Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. You kind of think that there's this, this little, little doll or something on, <laughs> standing next to your ear and constantly whispering, you know, it's not designed. Just stay on the straight and narrow. It's not designed. Uh, Richard Dawkins, River Out of Eden, 1995. The illusion of purpose is so powerful that biologists themselves use the assumption of good design as a working tool. It makes you think if it is such a useful heuristic for biology, why isn't it real? Uh, and so when you actually look in biological systems, you see all this amazing high-tech machinery. And you see this in the very simplest cells. If you went back 3.8 billion years to the very start of life, however life originated, you would see information storage, retrieval, processing, signal transduction circuitries, high-tech nanoengineering, uh, garbage removal, transportation distribution, communication systems, basically UPS type trucks delivering things inside the cells. Um, so you have a world of technology that's there before people come on the scene and invent the same technology. So it's really quite remarkable. One more quote from Richard Dawkins, apart from the differences in jargon, the pages of a molecular biology journal might be interchanged with those of a computer engineering journal. 
Well, computer engineering is design. And what are we looking at here, for instance? Uh, I would suggest to you that those look like gears. Mm -hmm. Well, where are those gears? They are in a little leafhopper insect, and those gears allow that leafhopper to jump 40 times its length. So it's, a, it's quite remarkable. So, you know, think of Superman bounding a, a tall building in a single bound. This, this little guy can do that, relatively speaking. Uh, on the left there is the Mexican blue morpho. It uses distributed, a distributed Bragg reflector. Okay. Uh, the DVRs, uh, they are basic to photonics, optoelectronics. Uh, semiconductor lasers use them, optical filters, optical sensors. Uh, so we need this in our technology, and yet the little Mexican blue morpho has invented or reinvented it. Uh, or maybe it was invented for him. Um, and then this one I just have to put in here, um, the late Bernard de Brera. I remember for, when he left a voicemail for me once, he said, uh, this is Bernard, Bernard de Brera, uh, world famous butterfly man. I've never seen somebody introduce himself like this, but he sent me a book, a beautiful catalog of butterflies. Cost about three hundred dollars, but it was like, would you review it? And then I reviewed it on my blog. But this was the caption of the uh, of under that it, underneath this butterfly, you know, the so-called uh, leaf butterfly, comma Liborni, not pretending to be a leaf. So, um, yeah, so I think here you have something that's simply a, a thing of beauty. Uh, there's an extravagance here to the design that seems to be something that is really unaccountable uh, from purely materialistic principles. Uh, not to belabor things, but here's what's become perhaps the poster thing of the intelligent design movement, the bacterial flagellum. There's this little bi-directional motor-driven propeller on the backs of certain bacteria. Uh, it can spin up to 100,000 RPM, almost 100% efficient for proton motive force, uh, marble of engineering. Uh, Howard Berg at Harvard, he discovered that this is, that it was this motile motility apparatus uh, called it the most efficient machine in the universe. Uh, and here is, uh, this is from a, a screenshot from BioVisions there ex vivo uh, in inner life of the cell. Uh, this is basically a little kinesin motor uh, protein that's moving a vesicle. Basically, you should think of this. This little thing is a UPS truck, and this is the back bed of it, which has its what it's delivering. Okay, and there's a, there's a dressing that's going on which tells it where it's moving. I think often we get these pictures of the cell as though it's just this amorphous blob of different things that are just moving around. It's like, who knows what's going on here? It's, everything is tightly orchestrated. There's nothing that's happening by accident here. And so I'm going to uh, give you this, uh, there's a three minute version and an eight minute version of this uh, video. I'll give you the three minute version with a uh, narration over it, which explains it, but I think uh, this is now 2006, but it still knocks my socks off. So. This is the story of a white blood cell that finds an infection and goes through the wall of an artery in order to stop that infection. What you see now is called lipid raft. It's made up of special phospholipids that pack tightly together and hold together the membrane proteins that are specifically linked to that lipid raft. These lipid rafts move around in the lipid, phospholipid bilayer and uh, coordinate activity. Now we are zooming down one of the microvilli inside of uh, one of those microvilli protrusions. What we see now is the polarization of actin from the actin monomers and actin forms the cytoskeletal net. This is gel solin. It cuts off a part of the actin filament. 
Now we see microtubulin assembling from tubulin monomers. And this is called catastrophe when the microtubules uh, move back. This is kinesin walking along the microtubule and pulling behind it a vesicle. Along this uh, picture, you can see a lot of microtubules, all with vesicles being pulled by various motor proteins. And in the center is the centrosome with its centrioles. This is the cell surface of the nucleus surface with nuclear pores, and mRNA is coming out of the nuclear pores, and now is assembling with a lysosome that allows the mRNA to be processed before the uh, ribosome, which is shown there, begins to read the mRNA and produce the protein. This is another ribosome assembling onto the surface of the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi body, and in this case, it's producing a protein that will be secreted. Uh, it's contained inside of the vesicle, inside of that membrane coat, and pulled to the outside of the cell by such a motor such as kinesin, which is shown here. And these are vesicles that are being dragged from the Golgi body, which is shown right here, to the outside of the cell, and we're going to watch them being secreted into the space between the membrane and the extracellular matrix, which is above. Uh, these proteins are secreted, but they don't leave the membrane because they're bound to the membrane. And these are the proteins, uh, the ICAM, that can reach up and, uh, and bind tightly to the receptor molecules on a cell that is signaling a problem somewhere behind the cell. Once ICAM binds, it uh, allows the white blood cell to go through a conformational change where the actin um, uh, matrix dissolves and it allows it to slither into the region where it needs to eat up the bacteria or the infection. Wow. Wow. Well, So I had this slide up before, but again, all these technologies are inside the cell and just got a little overview of that in this uh, BioVisions video. Uh, if you want to go find those videos on YouTube, uh, and put the uh, QR codes there for you. So I don't know if you want to do it, but uh, it's, uh, really quite remarkable and I just wanted to make that available to people. So anybody who, you know, afterwards uh, you can come here and I can give it to you. And I, I'm also going to post uh, the this, uh, the slides here is PDF uh, handout on my blog, so billbansky.com, so <clears throat> you'll have access to it there. Okay, one, one final uh, instance of design in biology uh, or apparent design. Uh, in the late 1940s, Claude Shannon developed his mathematical theory of information, uh, and basically he hit the, the key diagram in there is this communication diagram where you send messages across a channel and then there's noise and then the question is how do you get a signal to reliably move across a signal encoded in bits uh, when you have noise and so he proved various theorems about how you can do that reliably correct for error and things like that what you've got here though is a code you've got a simple convention on one end and a simple convention on the other uh, so code is not just a linguistic convention, it's moving from one thing to another. If you remember your decoder rings, you know, in, in your know, serial boxes 50, 60 years ago, whatever. But it's, <laughs> it's you're going from one, one set convention to another. Uh, so you, you, know, you may want to transliterate Greek characters into English characters and whatnot. Well, the thing is that theory, which was articulated in the late 40s, was then instantiated in the 50s when Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA and then in the succeeding eight years or so unlocked how the DNA coded for proteins. So you have basically Shannon information uh, represented in, the, in the, the genetic code, which 
is absolutely fundamental to life. Uh, so I can, I hope there, there may be time for me to speak more on that. Uh, okay, continuing right along. Next thing, show why Darwin cannot rule out intelligent design from biology. Darwinists, materialists want to rule it out, want to rule it out as a matter of definition, because then you just don't have to deal with it. Uh, but uh, and so it, what's Darwin's challenge to intelligent design is that he proposed a naturalistic mechanism that was supposed to be able to do everything that intelligent design, that a designing agent could do. And so at the heart of his mechanism is natural selection acting on random variations, which in the neo-Darwinian theory are random genetic mutations, and that this can explain the emergence of biological information. So the received wisdom is that Darwin hit it out of the park, and that by attributing the diversity of life to natural causes rather than supernatural creation, Darwin gave biology a sound scientific basis. The implication being that before that, and now after that, intelligent design people like myself, that there is no sound scientific basis. David Hall, a philosopher of biology at Northwestern University, I knew him. Uh, he was a postdoc at Northwestern in uh, 1992. Uh, he wrote, uh, he, Darwin, dismissed it, design, not because it was an incorrect scientific explanation, but because it was not a proper scientific explanation at all. So it's like Wolfgang Pauli, right? Uh, you know, his, his big insult was it's not even wrong. Right? You know, so that's, that's what they're saying. You're not even the right ball. You can't be science. So intelligent, the received wisdom then is that intelligent design is not science because it cannot be science. And we can credit Darwin for removing intelligent design from science. And now, this is really the critical thing, uh, if there's a takeaway from this slide. You know, so the point is to stress then, people who are taking this line, is that this is fundamentally a science versus religion controversy. Okay? And if that's the case, who wins? Well, science wins, right? But what I'm proposing and what my colleagues in the intelligent design community are proposing that it's really a science versus science controversy. And if that's the case, then we're on a level playing field, and then these theories have to duke it out on their own merits. They can't just define themselves into victory. So is intelligent design science? Well, uh, is this guy a design theorist? Who is this? Well, Francis Crick. You, know, you just saw him earlier, right? Uh, biologists must constantly remind themselves of what they see is not design, but rather evolved. Now, he was co-discoverer of the structure of DNA with James Watson, 1953 Nature article, got won him the Nobel Prize, very sharp guy. But uh, he proposed the theory of directed panspermia. And here he is looking inebriated. Uh, this is James Watson, <laughs> Alex Rich, and Origin of Life uh, scientist was in the order. Uh, so, what is directed panspermia? Well, panspermia, the idea there is, if you leave off the directed, is that somehow organic molecules somehow elsewhere in the galaxy, someplace outside of Earth, uh, life was more likely to form than it did here. And it formed, it hitched rides on things like comets and got deposited on Earth, and that's how life got going. Basically, life was seeded. That's the idea of panspermia. Pan, all spermia is seeds. So these seeds are coming in from outer space. The thing is, yeah, space is a pretty inhospitable place. I mean, you're getting buffeted by cosmic rays, you know, it's very cold. Uh, so, yeah, probably not the most hospitable place to try to stay alive in some form so you can get to planet Earth. So better than just hitching a ride on a comet is hitching a ride on a spaceship. And so the record is that you've got Aliens who created life or somehow life originated elsewhere in the universe and then brought it to planet Earth, seeded it here, and then it got going. Okay, that's the idea. Now, it may sound crazy. I mean, there is a sense in which, I mean, obviously, it pushes the problem back, kicks the can down the road because where did life first originate? And to his credit, uh, 
Francis Crick didn't recognize this. He said it's just that the problem of life's origin on Earth is very difficult. And so if it, you know, so this is, he was exploring a possibility. Um, but uh, if you grant directed panspermia as a scientific hypothesis, and I think you have to, and in fact, I'll, I'll indicate momentarily why I think you have to, um, then it's, if an alien could create life, then that's an intelligence. So we have got an intelligent agency that's behind life. You know, we can imagine, uh, well, let me just go move along a little bit and then I can, but uh, Stephen Meyer, good friend and colleague, I mean, you wrote a book called Signature in the Cell, came out about 10 years, actually uh, 14 years ago now. Uh, but he looks at features of the cell that provide a signature of intelligence. But you don't have to take his word for it. Craig Venter, one of the key people on the Human Genome Project, uh, he uh, has watermarked DNA, so put Venter Institute, other things, he's coded that into DNA. He has an artificial life project. Now it sounds, you know, when you hear artificial life, you probably think, well, you know, you're just going, getting rocks and water and just very basic chemicals, and then you're just going to put it all together. That's not what he did. You know, he took fully functioning cells, then he rearranged some DNA, put it back into a cell, uh, and then he killed off the cells, wild cells that didn't have that DNA, and then he called that artificial life. Okay, I mean, but the fact is, if you're talking about artificial life, you've got something that's intelligently designed, right? So it's, uh, so you're, you're doing intelligent design and you're doing it in biology. So, uh, you, know, and I, you know, we can imagine scenarios where you have super advanced 3D printers that are printing life, you know, and that would be an intelligent design process. It would not be a Darwinian process. And given that that is a real possibility, it, it does suggest, does mean that intelligent design can't be ruled out of science, can't be ruled out of biology just by stroking your pen. So what, can, what we can we conclude? Biology has no way of ruling out intelligent design on first principles. Design in biology could be real, as demonstrated by Venter, and it could be detectable as through his watermarking. Moving along. So Next thing I want to do is challenge that Darwin provided a better explanation of biological origins than intelligent design. It's one thing to say, okay, intelligent design may be science, but it's just bad science. Darwin just came up with something that was so much better, more insightful, more powerful. Uh, so let's see if that actually is the case. Now, uh, again, you know, I had this slide up before. Darwin, I would say, didn't rule out intelligent design. Uh, he did propose, though, this mechanism of natural selection at the end random variation. So he claimed that that was a better explanation. Now, where does Darwin work? Okay, I mean, his theory does have a certain scope, a certain application. So what do we have here? We've got, here's a cave fish. Here's another related fish. This one's eye is just fine. This guy's can the cavefish eye has disappeared. The cavefish lives in total darkness, doesn't need it, and it goes. Okay. You could say that that's Darwinian by not putting resources toward the eye, it puts more resources to, toward other things and probably enhances its survival that way. So you can give a plausible Darwinian explanation for that. Um, Finch beaks, you know, they change in response to weather conditions where nuts are either softer, harder, bigger, whatever. And so you've got different types of finch beaks that develop. And so you have, have these on the Galapagos Islands and elsewhere. So uh, Darwin, it seems, explains that quite well. Now, where do you get beaks in the first place? Where do you get birds in the first place? That's, that's the bigger question. And that's, that's Darwin's claim to fame. If it was just finch beaks, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And another case would be an abiotic resistance, where you have uh, some uh, 
bacterium will happen by chance to have a resistance to an antibiotic, then the antibiotic is applied. The others that don't have that resistance die off. Then the, the one that had the resistance now gets multiplied. And so that's, that then takes over the population. And so uh, survival of the fittest, natural selection has done its work. Okay, but that's really not the, the thing that makes Darwin such a great theory. Darwin's such a great theory. You know, question then is where doesn't it work? You know, and I would put it to you, and we saw this in that Biovisions video, uh, high-tech nanoengineering inside the cell. So let's look at what's the uh, prime example that's been pointed to of intelligent design. I, mean, I, I don't think it's the best one, but it's, it's gotten the most play. And this is the bacterial flagellum. So you have this uh, tail on the backs of certain bacteria. And I say here spins at 17,000 RPM. Uh, it can go up to 100,000 RPM. It can change direction in a quarter turn. And it's really quite a remarkable little engine. Uh, proton powered, sometimes sodium powered drive, stator rotor, various rings. Uh, you've got a, um, you've got this hook, which is a universal joint. You've got this filament that acts as the propeller. Uh, so the marvel of nanoengineering. This is this is in bacteria. Bacteria are much smaller cells than our average cells, about uh, tenth the diameter. So these are, you know, your E. coli will have things like this. Uh, and so it, it, it's a motility structure. It helps the bacterium to move around its, uh, its watery environment. Here's another image of it, another one. And it's wired into signal transduction circuitry sensors, which will then allow it to do chemotaxis so that, you know, the idea is, why are you moving while you're trying to find a, a food source? Or you're trying to get away from some sort of poison. And so the, the sensors will tell it, keep going in the same direction. And then it will change direction. It's bi-directional so that if it's, if it's going in a certain direction, it's like, wait a second, there's no more food here. Then it'll switch direction, and then it'll tumble, and then it can reset itself. So it's really doing a random walk to try to find nutrients or to avoid things that will harm it. So how did such systems arise? Okay, and what, what, and what, what's the nature of these systems? Well, uh, what you have is they're multi-part. Uh, even the, the simplest flagellum will have about 30 protein parts. Some of them have 40, 45 or so. Um, they're functionally integrated. Everything is working together for a purpose. Uh, it's not like a Rube Goldberg device where you've got one thing, it goes to another thing, it goes to another thing, it goes to another thing. At the end of the day, you know, so you have something that pours coffee, but you could eliminate all the rest of it that led up to that. Uh, so it's functionally integrated. It's non simplifiable, non simplifiable in the sense that if you remove something, it's going to stop working. And there's no hidden structure in the sense that. Uh, there's, there's something that we're not seeing that could be doing it. You know, there could be, you know, like uh, there's a theory of mind in which inside the brain, there's a little guy who's thinking a homunculus, okay? So that would be a hidden structure that's coming for our intelligence. Well, there's no, nothing hidden there. I mean, with the bacterial flagellum, we are down to the brass tacks molecular level. There's nothing going on below that that we may be missing, you know, and trying to account for its mechanical abilities. And so when we see this, these are irreducibly complex systems. The, the term irreducible complexity is due to my colleague, Michael Behe. And so systems like this are, uh, they're, they're machines, they are uh, highly complex, and they seem to be beyond the reach of Darwinian processes. Uh, so then I want to elaborate, what does it mean to say seems beyond the reach, okay? So, how, so let's, let's talk a little bit about how evolutionary theory, when I'm talking Darwinian evolutionary theory, attempts to account for something like the bacterial flagellum. So, you know, you imagine, how do you evolve to something like this? You know, evolution is gradual. You have to, bit by bit, you have to take baby steps, make small changes, small changes, and then you get to the thing that you're evolving to. 
But the thing is, you don't have that function of a bacterial flagellum until all the pieces are in place. So how do you get to that, you know? Before you have all those pieces, it's not serving as a bacterial flagellum. Well, this is then the way that the, the Darwinists uh, propose to, to account for that. And it's what, so what can be called co-evolutionary co-options. So it's structures and their functions co-evolve with old structures being co-opted to serve new functions. Co-opting means to take something from one area and then repurpose it for another. So you can imagine something like a mouse trap. What if we wanted to explain the evolution of a mouse trap? Well, we've got we've got five basic parts there. We've got the base, we've got the hammer that crushes the mouse, we've got the uh, a string that's attached to the hammer, you have a holding bar, and then a catch where you put the cheese. Okay? There are also these uh, pins that hold it in place, but let's just ignore them. Let's, let's just think that there are five basic parts. So how do you get this a working mouse trap with these parts? If you remove the hammer, you can no longer crush the mouse. If you remove the spring, you no longer can do it. But are there some ways to modify this? Okay. And what the co-option co-evolution approach says is, well, it didn't start out being a mouse trap. You might imagine that first you had a base, and its purpose was not to catch mice, but to serve as a doorstop. Serve as a really good doorstep. And then, because evolution always works by gradually uh, increasing complexity, and you've got to keep adding to things, it's incremental. Uh, then, let's say you add the hammer and the spring. Okay? Now, you've got a perfectly good tie clip. You, know, you can put that on, and it'll be a tie clip. Uh, when you're still not at a uh, uh, full fledged mouse trap. Next, you add the catch and the holding bar, and uh, then now you've got a, got a mouse trap. So, this is I know this may seem like a crazy example, but this is actually how biologists think of it. And it they really have no options other than that because you have to have selection working at each point, so you've got to have something that can survive and actually ideally will also be an improvement, otherwise, you've got what's called neutral evolution, so you don't have selection working for you. So you've got to, you got to keep, there's got, selection has to keep working for you. You got, the thing has to be viable and doing something, and it's got to change, okay? And it can't have the, the, the final function because you don't have a function until you have all the pieces in place. So it has to be doing something different. So structure and functions co-evolve. Structure changes, there's a new function. Structure changes, a new function. Structure changes, new function. That's how it works. And I can show, prove this to you uh, with how the evolutionary biology community tries to account for the bacterial flagellum. So here you've got uh, the flagellum, and here you have something that's called the type 3 secretory system. This is a little poison injection system. Uh, that is on um, Yersinia pestis, the bubonic plague bacterium, and it's basically, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a needle nose pump that uh, will pump poisons into creatures like ourselves. And the thing is, this, the proteins for this are represented in the flagellum, and the flagellum has something like this because it has to extrude that filament uh, which then ends up being the tail. So there's a similarity. It's the, the, in a sense, this type 3 secretory system is embedded in the bacterial flagellum. And so the argument is then made, well, the bacterial flagellum evolved from this system. But here's the problem. I mean, let's imagine by analogy then, you know, you're trying to evolve that the, this motorcycle is uh, akin to the flagellum, and now you've got the motor. How do you evolve this motor into that motorcycle? You still have all this other stuff that's unaccounted for, and this motor would have evolved for some other purpose, so how do you adapt this motor so it can, sorry, uh, so that it can uh, evolve into this, this motorcycle? 
So it's it's a it's a real problem. You know, it would be one thing if you had if, if it was a gradual step by step process, but even with the type three secretory system, you have ten, at least ten proteins that you need to add to the system. Now, they might people might say, well, you know, there were further intermediate steps, but we don't have them. You know, this is a huge jump to go from a T three SS to a bacterial flagellum. Uh, so it's it, it, it's, it's, it's not a detailed, fully accounted for evolutionary explanation that we're looking at. Uh, so you've got, as I said, you know, at least 10 proteins are found in the flagellum that are not in this type 3 secretory system. So, and here's, I, I think uh, I'll let two biologists who are not design people, they're actually quite critical of it, but this is what they will say about these sorts of explanations, these co-option, co-evolution explanations of things like the bacterial flagellum from the type 3 secretory system. This is James Shapiro at the University of Chicago. When I speak to him in private, I visited with him at his office at the University of Chicago, and our paths have crossed a number of times over the years. Uh, he is more anti-Darwinian than I am. I mean, I've, I've said to him, uh, you know, I think, you know, I think Darwin at least, you know, his, his idea of natural selection by random variation. It's useful. I mean, evolutionary computing is, has been inspired by it. And he looks at me and says, no, Darwin was, there's absolutely nothing good to <laughs> you know? But here's, uh, here's, what, I mean, here's what he'll say. He said, there are no detailed Darwinian accounts for the evolution of any fundamental biochemical or cellular system, only a variety of wishful speculations. It is remarkable that Darwinism is accepted as a satisfactory explanation for such a vast subject, evolution, with so little rigorous examination of how well its basic theses work in eliminating specific instances of biological adaptation or diversity. Now, I've said he's not a, a design guy. He holds to something called natural engineering or uh, natural genetic engineering, where basically cells are intelligent in the sense that they can do their own engineering. They can, as it were, look forward and then engineer the things that they need to, to evolve. Um, so he, his, uh, if you want to see what he's thinking, you can go to his website, The Third Way of Evolution. So not intelligent design, not Darwinism. Uh, Franklin Harold in his book, The Way of the Cell. And this is, both these quotes are old and I've used them for years, but nothing has really changed here. Uh, he will write, there are presently no detailed governing accounts of the evolution of any Biochemical or cellular system, only a variety of wishful speculations. Does that sound familiar? Did you see that phrase yeah. before? And, uh, you know, uh, Franklin Harold, this was written four years after uh, James Shapiro. Uh, I don't believe uh, the disciplinary committee of was it Colorado State took into account because of plagiarism, you know, plagiarism <laughs> Shapiro. But, uh, you know, so you wonder is there such a self-evident truth once you look into it, that this is really what's going on. So I think it's useful just to see the, the difference in logic between the uh, Darwinian and the non-Darwinian. So Darwinists tend to dismiss intelligent design as an argument from ignorance. No one has figured out how the flagellum evolved, therefore it must have been designed. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that certain Biological systems have a feature, we can call it irreducible complexity. Darwinian explanations have been spectacularly unsuccessful in explaining these systems. Intelligent agency has the causal power to produce systems that explain or that display irreducible complexity. Most of the engineering feats that we produce are irreducibly complex. Therefore, biological systems that exhibit irreducible complexity are likely to be designed. So this is it's, it's an argument, I mean, it's, uh, it's a probabilistic sort of argument. It's inherently fallible, but it's not wrong-headed. No. All right, moving along. Uh, well, next to sketch how we detect and infer design in intelligent agency. So it's one thing to have these intuitions about design. It's another thing also to see that Darwinian theory has not really been all that convincing, it hasn't explained the problems that it claims to explain. But it's another thing 
to say, okay, well, what can we really mean when we ascribe design to something? Is, is there a science there? Is there something that is, uh, that has some rigor to it? Or is it just that we have this kind of intuition? Uh, or is it, are we just arguing by analogy? Is it just that, you know, we have these things that we designed as humans, and now we look and we find that, uh, that uh, find things that look like that in biology. But uh, in fact, it's, uh, I would say it goes much deeper than that. And so let's, uh, let's look at how we actually detect and infer design. So let's go back to this search for extraterrestrial intelligence example. So what persuaded the scientists that they had found an extraterrestrial intelligence? Uh, I don't know, how many of you saw that movie, Contact? Okay, nice. Uh, so there was a key mo moment in the movie uh, where design or intelligence, uh, extra alien intelligence was discovered. It was where they get, these radio astronomers get a series of beats and pauses amplified on the speaker system and it goes. So I've represented the beats as ones, the pauses as zeros, and what is it? Well, it's a long sequence of prime numbers. Prime numbers from two to 101. Prime numbers are numbers visible only by themselves in ones. They're mathematically significant. So it's two, three, five, seven, not nine, because nine is three times three, 11, 13, 17, 19, and so on. And so that's what persuaded them that they were dealing with an intelligence. And now what, what is it about that sequence? Well, it was the detection of, I would put to you, a highly improbable complex specified event. It had to be a long sequence. If it was just pause, that's three bits of information. That's, that's probability one in eight. You know, if you flip a coin a few times, you'll probably see two heads and a tail. Nothing there that's going to require a whole lot of explanation. But if you get this, if you claim to have gotten this whole sequence by flipping a coin, heads as ones, tails as zeros, that would be unbelievable. So what are we looking for then in a criterion for design detection? What should we be looking for? Complexity or improbability and specification independent patterns. So let me elaborate on that. So first, the connection with the complexity between complexity and probability. Here you've got a uh, combination block. This is one uh, I finally updated my image in my talks. This is uh, one that I got off of Amazon just this week. I didn't buy it, but I got the image. And so again, <laughs> apparently it's you punch in uh, five digits and that will open the lock. Okay, well that's you've got. 10 possibilities with each punch, you know, so it's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. So 100,000 possibilities or one in 100,000 chance of opening this mechanism by chance. If it was, if you had to punch in 10 numbers, then it would be one in 10 billion. You know? So depending on the number of things you've got to punch and how and get right, you know, the probabilities go, uh, go down, you know, the probabilities become smaller. But the smaller the probability, the greater the complexity. And the thing is, any probability can be thought of as a power of two, you know, and then that exponent of the power of two then becomes a number of bits. So if I flip a coin three times, it's one half times one half times one half, or one eighth, but that's one over two to the third power or three bits of information. So there's this correspondence between probability and bits. So if I give you a probability, I can give you a corresponding number of bits. If I give you bits, I can, by raising one over two to that, uh, to that uh, bit number of bits, uh, then I, I get a probability. And, you, and we're, we, we allow fractional bits, okay? So we can get any probability. So that's, uh, that's what, uh, what we're looking at uh, here. And that's what creates this connection between complexity and probability. So complexity, we think of it as number of bits. You know, smaller probabilities, you know, if, it's, if, I, if I flip a coin 100 times, that's 100, 
100 bits. It's one, in, 1 over 2 to the 100, or about 1 in 10 to the 30. You know, that's a 10 with 30 zeros after. That's the probability, very small probability, but then 100 bits. So, uh, so that's, that's why complexity and probability are using them as, they're basically the same notion, it's just a different way of, of expressing it. Why probability? Unless we discipline our use of probabilities, we can explain anything. I mean, we've all heard of the chance of the game, the God of the gaps argument, well, there's also a chance of the gaps. Um, my favorite instance is, um, this is uh, from the film, this is Spinal Tap. You have these, uh, it's a rock mockumentary, a satire. And so you have these musicians from the group Spinal Tap that are sitting around and they're describing how a long string of uh, drummers had passed away. I mean, if this, is, this is the group you definitely did not want to be a drummer in this group. <laughs> and so, uh, so one of the drummers apparently spontaneously combusted. <laughs> so the thing is, what would it take to spontaneously combust? Well, laws of thermodynamics actually uh, don't de deny categorically that that could happen. They just say it's very, very improbable. But, you know, temperature is mean kinetic energy of, in this case, the air molecules in this room. If all the very fastest ones in this room suddenly converged on me, I could spontaneously combust right before you. <laughs> there was a probability of that, okay? Uh, but it is extremely improbable. You know? And so, I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking, you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, picking one grain of sand from all the grains of sand um, in the world and doing that 50,000 times. Or more, <laughs> something like that. I mean, so getting lucky is not a good scientific <laughs> explanation. But you need more than just improbability. Because just about anything that happens is highly improbable. What you need is also you need this match with a pattern. Um, and it's got to be the right sort of pattern. It's got to be a pattern that when, when, when you have that match, that will tell you that you're, you're really dealing with something that's not just a result of chance. So conventional statistical theory knows all about that. And what they refer to is do, setting up a rejection region in advance of an experiment. And so you can think of it, for instance, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to just skip that for the time. Uh, so the, and the types of patterns that I'm going to be dealing with, I call them specifications. These are the types of patterns that in the presence of improbability will get us uh, get us a design inference or detect design for us. So you, you can imagine uh, it this way. Um, here you've got an archer, got a wall in front there. I'm going to start shooting arrows at that wall. The wall, let's say, is very large, and I, you know, I'm not going to miss that wall. The arrowhead has a very small tip, so the precise probability of where that arrow is going to land, assuming it's just going to land and stick in the wall, is going to be very improbable. But now you can imagine two things. One is I shoot the arrow and then I get out a bucket of paint and I draw a target around the arrow. Okay. Now I'm guaranteed to hit a bullseye, but you'll know nothing about my ability as, a, uh, as an archer, nothing about my design or skill as an archer from that because the pattern is not the right sort of pattern. The pattern is read off of the event. What you want is an independently given pattern that is put there. So what do we do in an Olympic competition? This is Justin Hewish, who won two gold medals in Atlanta in 1996. You fix the target, and then you shoot at it. Now, it becomes a matter of bad faith if you keep hitting the target and say, oh, that's just luck, right? Eventually, you draw a design matrix. Why? Because highly improbable. You've got, it's got to be improbable. If it's not improbable, you haven't raised the bar on the athlete, right? I mean, they're not, they're not trying hard. You haven't, you're, you're not testing them for their excellence. So you've got to hit, got to set that target. It's got to be hard to hit it by chance. And then when they don't hit it, when they do hit it, then you'll know that you're dealing with design. Now, the example I just gave is you set the rejection region in advance of the event. Thing is, in biology, we're here after the fact, right? 
event has happened, and now we are looking at those patterns in biology. So how can we assure ourselves that it's not like we're just drawing the target after the arrow has landed? And this is where my book, The Design Inference, and uh, the second edition that's going to be coming out, uh, this was its, really its main contribution to say, what happens? How do we make sense of these specifications that in the presence of complexity allow us to infer design if they are after the fact? Okay, and so I just want to at least convince you that after the fact specifications work perfectly fine for inferring design. So consider a case of cryptography. And this is just a very short sequence. Well, you look at this and you might say, well, this sure, this looks kind of random. Uh, you know, maybe the letter F appears a little too more than you might expect. That is not a long sequence. Anybody see the pattern there? Is there something that would tell you that it's not the result of chance? You know, but then you remember the old Caesar cipher. Caesar, I think, used this in the Gallic War, and it's where you basically moved each letter of the alphabet up or down, fixed number of notches, and now you've got, he thinks it is like a weasel. So M goes to N, or N goes to N, yeah, M goes to N. Basically, just move one letter up, E goes to F, T goes to U, H goes to I, and so on. Now, once you see this pattern, can you think that this is the result of chance? It's a rhetorical question. I would like you to answer it. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, I think I, my sense is you should say, no, this cannot be the result of chance because of this connection. Uh, there's a pattern here, and you can't account for that pattern, that coincidence, which would be improbable, and where you also have this objective pattern. Uh, where it's, it's, what's the pattern? It's given by this very simple uh, encryption key. So that's, you know, this, this is a case where it's after the fact. You first confronted this, you didn't see the pattern, and then you did some further investigation and you saw after the fact, oh, this could not have been the result of chance. Okay? So, uh, the methodology for doing all of this, specification complexity, uh, I encapsulated that in something called the explanatory filter. Um, uh, this is a, it's, uh, there's actually a, you used to have three decision modes, but really only two decision modes are necessary. Uh, I developed this at length in the first edition of my book, Design Inference, and now the second edition is coming out. Uh, should, they're, they're advertising it out as October, but I, I think it's probably more realistic in, uh, in November. So, uh, so but the, the takeaway is that there are reliable methods of design detection. And what is it that the design inference is actually detecting? And it is uh, what I would call then specified complexity. Uh, it's interesting, if you go to specified complexity in Wikipedia, you'll find specified complexity is a creationist argument by William Dembski, uh, which is being fully debunked you know, or something like that. You know, it's first sentence, you gotta get all the, all the, you know, pejoratives and everything in there just to make sure that nobody takes it seriously. Interesting thing though, that specified complexity, I didn't invent the term. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Wikipedia credits it to me, but it was actually invented by Leslie Ordle. You, you saw this picture actually next to uh, Francis Crick back in the 70s. And it was a term that was actually getting quite a bit of nice use. People like Paul Davies used it. Um, Richard Dawkins had the concept, he, he didn't use specified complexity, but he used the term specification and complexity in the same sentence. Uh, and complicated. But uh, I started using the term and developing these ideas, and that's when the term suddenly uh, was, was no longer uh, legitimate science. Uh, but anyway, what is then specified complexity? I mean, the way I gave it to you is basically you check is it complex, is it specified? But this is where, um, this is actually probably the most exciting thing in this forthcoming book, at least conceptually, although. It, it's, uh, it takes, takes a bit of mathematical heavy lifting to, to deal with it. But uh, so defining this key intelligence metric specified complexity. 
And basically what it does is, so it's much like complexity does, is it, you know, what makes something a specification? And what makes it a specification is that it has a short description. And its minimum description length is very short. And I, let me motivate that. But the thing is, once you have descriptions, descriptions can be characterized in bits from the language. But then probabilities can be characterized in bits also. You get the probability, basically what you do is you take a negative logarithm to a base two to get any form of probability to information measures. So, uh, so what specified complexity does is it takes the complexity in bits, we talked about complexity, of an event's probability, and then you subtract from it the length in bits of the shortest description that describes the event. Okay, now this is a mouthful, but let me make it even more difficult. Given the symbols. So specified complexity. This H here, basically you can just think of this as the chance hypothesis that's under consideration. So you can kind of ignore that, but you know, you're always trying to knock down a chance hypothesis or a family of chance hypotheses. Because you know it's it's these design inferences, they work by knocking down chance. I mean you always want to give chance a chance. You know, if you can explain by natural causes, you do so. But if you see a body lying there. You know, right now somebody is 95 years old who has had congestive heart failure, you know, probably natural causes, you know, will try to default to that. But then if you find certain marks from injury and so on, then you'll say, no, wait a second, it wasn't natural causes. Cool. So, so that's, this is SC, specified complexity. So you've got the information or the complexity associated with the event. And then you've got what it takes to describe the event. And you want the minimum description length. Often you don't get, to, you can't get to the minimum description length. It turns out that minimum description length is there, there are computational reasons that it's it's not computable. This ends up being a form of chromosomal complexity. But if you don't get to the minimum minimum description length, then what do you have? You've got something that's a little bigger. So if anything, you're underestimating specified complexity. So that's okay. Okay. I know this is very fast, you know, but uh, it's it, it, it all coheres. Okay, so but let me give some, uh, you know, just say a little bit more, just to at least try to make this seem reasonable. What specified complexity does is it really weds canon information and Kolmogorov information. These are two fundamental notions of information. Kolmogorov was premier probabilist of the 20th century. Um, and he developed a notion of information where the information content of something is, in is characterized in terms of its compressibility. Something is uh, information rich if it you can't compress it, otherwise its information goes down. So a sequence of coin tosses, for instance, if you have 100 heads in a row, that doesn't have much Kolmogorov complexity because it can, you, you can compress it and basically write a program that says repeat heads Hundred times. You know? uh, on the other hand, that sequence in terms of actual coin toss is going to be highly improbable. You know, to get a hundred heads in a row, as with any other sequence, is going to take oh, it is going to be highly improbable. So it brings those two notions together. It does it. It really comes right out of the design inference. You will not find specified complexity in, for instance, a, fun, a typical uh, information theory book. This is a really good one. Uh, but it, it's in its full technical form. Also, it requires you know, certain conditions, prefix that the language has to be prefix to binary and Turing complete. These are not oner onerous restrictions, but it ends up that specified complexity is a unified information measure that measures intelligence. So it's, it's a real contribution to information theory, and it's getting at a lot of what's all being discussed these days in uh, in biology. Where People are trying to come to terms with the information problem that's there. But let me let me just try to uh, motivate this. And then uh, if we're going a bit long, I know we got started a little bit late, and I do want to leave some time for, for QA. But uh, let me skip the, the first uh, first example uh, with uh, uh, the royal flushers with pairs, two pairs. But uh, let me just jump to these. Um, what I'm going to look at are some long sequences of ones and zeros. And I just want to give you the sense of the difference between them and how specified complexity makes sense of them. So here, 
you have, first off, this is, we've, we've seen this sequence already. This was the one from the film Contact, right? It's, uh, you've got uh, one one that's representing two beasts, that's the number two. And then there's a separator, three ones, that's the number three separator, five ones, separator, and so on, all the way up to 101. Okay, so if you wanted to get this, and no, let's just, we're just gonna go with the probability distribution being uniform uh, coin toss and independent identically distributed as probabilists should say. Uh, the theory is not wedded to everything being uniform probability distribution for just the simplicity, let's just do this. Uh, so this would be highly improbable, one in two, to the 1,186 is the, would be the improbability. That's, that's smaller probability than one in 10 to the 300, okay? They're only about 80, 80 to nine, 10 to the 80, 10 to the 90 elementary particles. Uh, you couldn't, with this many, uh, with, with the sort of improbability there, you still couldn't explore an average protein space considering it's consisting of 400 amino acids. So it's, uh, so this is, I mean, it's highly improbable. Uh, and at the same time though, it's easily described, right? It's prime numbers, okay? Now consider this sequence. These are truly random numbers, okay? There's no pattern that you're gonna see there. Probably the best you're gonna do, unless, you know, unless you know, something really weird happened, but probably the best thing you're gonna be able to see and do is something like, Three zeros, then a one, two zeros, then a one, then a zero, uh, two ones, two zeros, I don't know, it's it, 10 ones, you know, zero, and so on. But basically, you're going to have to describe it. It's going to be a very long description. And that long description is going to be subtracted from the improbability. And when you do that, the specified complexity comes way down. That's why this number is not going to trigger a design inference. The descriptive complexity is going to cancel out the, the if you will, probabilistic complexity there. And then finally, here's this number. Uh, this is called the Champernoun uh, sequence. Champernoun numbers. Uh, this is David Gavin Champernoun, another theorist. Uh, but basically, what he does is he arranges binary numbers in a lexicographical order. So zero, one, and then there's two digits of binary numbers, zero, one, two, which is one zero, and then three. And then three digit binary numbers, three zeros, that's a zero, 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 one, that's one, zero, one, zero, that's two, zero, one, one, that's three, and so on. And then he just keeps counting. Well, that's easily described, right? Binary numbers in increasing lexicographical order. That's short, minus that long sequence in probability. Again, you get high specified complexity. So, again, you would know that this is not a consequence of chance. And uh, let's go back to the uh, one of the key uh, things that incriminated Mark Tessier Levine, uh, president of Stanford. Diagram. And note what, uh, what was said by this law report. It is not clear how the single image could be representative, uh, could be a representative control image reported in both figures given that different experimentation and samples reported. So different experiments, it's not clear how. Really? You know, that's, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, I guess lawyers speak for it. It's, it's, Highly improbable, you know. That's that's what we're, we're dealing with. So let me see. I think I'm, I'm going to skip this. So let me give you one final example. Um, so uh, Darth Vader to Luke Skywalker in The Empire Strikes Back. Okay. Darth to Luke. No, I am your father. Your father is a description. It's very short. Lots of people in the world, lots of people in, I guess, the galaxy where he's moving around. So highly improbable that he would be he facing Darth and very simple description, okay? Improbability, simple description. Suggestive specified complexity, yes? 
Okay, the film Spaceballs. Yeah, looks parody. Okay, I am. Your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. That's a long description. If you get that long description, it's not however improbable it is that he should be there with dark helmet. It doesn't, it doesn't call for the design inference. There's no specified complexity here. I realize it's a frivolous example, but it does make the point, right? It's that we have this, this balance between the improbability and then the descriptive one. And we can cash both out as bits, and that, that minus is actually a very natural minus. It's not just that it's a, this is not an artificial, this is a, this is a fundamental information measure, unified information measure. So, so what's the lesson? Uh, the point of the joke is that the relationship is so complicated and contrived and requires such a long description that it evokes no suspicion and calls for no special explanation. Everybody on planet Earth can act by no more than six degrees of separation. Some long description like this is bound to identify. So that's from second edition of the design inference. So why is all this important? What can you do about it? So let's wrap it up. Uh, central to our worldview is our origin story. The worldview focuses on where we come from, who we are, the slice we each and where we are going. Christian worldview sees the origin of the universe and us in an act of creative intelligence. The Darwinian, the naturalistic, and materialistic worldview sees the origin of the universe in us in a blind, purposeless process that did not have us in mind. So who we are, what life's main challenge is, what's life's main challenge, uh, where we're going, are all downstream from that origin story. So that's why it's important. Um, you know, and let me just elaborate on from Christian worldview, our origin is in a creator God, in a designer, more than a designer, but he's at least a designer. We are made in the image of God. Our key challenge is to deal with sin, the corruption in our hearts. And where we're going is uh, to be united with God uh, through the redemption that is in Christ. Uh, the worldview, the naturalistic worldview, is that we're the result of a purposeless, blind process. Uh, we are meat machines. Uh, we are mechanisms, uh, we have no ultimate future, and our problem is really a problem of our evolutionary conditioning. Uh, it's, it's a problem of our material constitution and dynamics and how we play out. Uh, there's no higher purpose. So uh, that's a worldview, you know, and uh, you know, how do we decide whether which worldview is true? All well, this intelligent design speaks to that. Uh, intelligent design, you know, I think it's often said, well, you know, evolution doesn't imply atheism. That's right. But atheism does imply evolution. Uh, well, you know, there's a, some form of Darwinian evolution or materialistic evolution. If atheism, if there is no God, if there's no intelligence, then we have to be the product of such blind purposeless process. So if intelligent design says no, that form of evolution is false, then you got a logic thing that's called a modus tollens. If A, then B, not B, therefore not A. If atheism, therefore evolution, not evolution because of intelligent design, therefore not atheism. So it ends up being a very powerful argument, and that's why you have people like Richard Dawkins and others who are very much against it. And it's no accident also why somebody like a Richard Dawkins is the most popular atheist in the English speaking world. Why he's also an evolutionist. And they, they go hand in glove. Uh, so there's no accident there. It's no accident to somebody like Christopher Hitchens, who I debated in Plano before his death. Uh, you know, he was a literature guy. He was not a biologist, but in his book, God is Not Great, he had a whole chapter on Darwinism. Why does he need Darwinism? Why does he need this? Because if atheism is true, then you gotta have Darwinism. Or some, something like Darwinism. Okay, and then finally, what can you do about it? And I would say inform yourself. And I, I was tempted, I just ran out of time. I could have just put up a whole bunch of books, but uh, I figured this one, um, yeah. Sorry, my <laughs> <laughs> I really, 
I mean, it's it's got a lot in there. I mean, if you if you master what's in there, you'll have a very good grasp of this. You can talk to design. There's a whole chapter on evolutionary biology. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff there. And so if you want to look about on this, uh, here's the QR code for Discovery Institute Press, which is about to tell you more about this. So I know it went a bit long, uh, but uh, there's a lot to cover, and uh, I thought it was was worth it to get the whole overview. So I don't know. I mean, I think you said we have till nine, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions. Uh, Alan, uh, you know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, though. So you, you don't yeah, know. let's do some uh, Q and A. First, let's thank Dr. Dinkins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have a microphone, so just uh, speak up if you can there. I, I, think I will try to repeat the question. You know, sometimes I say I will do that when I get so involved. This is being recorded and streamed, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So let's just give it a So, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, atheism and, um, and the, the intelligent design, but uh, what about the theist, uh, theistic evolution guys? Because they have a story too. Which I think uh, you guys also have. Uh, there's some friction there too. The, the theistic evolutionists uh, have some some foundational uh, tenets that you guys take issue with too. So it, yeah. I think it was kind of a third group with another real group. Is that, is that yeah? I mean, it's interesting that you bring up the, the theistic evolutionists. I mean, the theistic evolutionists, the way. I would characterize them, and I think you know, I think often they don't like the term, you know, but I'm not sure what color they want to, you know, they can characterize themselves any way they want, but uh, they will take the Darwinian or neo-Darwinian or you know some naturalistic form of evolution as the best science. So they think we're completely wrong on the science. They think that you know if it's a question between Darwin and the intelligent design guys, they're gonna go with Darwin. But then they will put a theological gloss on it. And they'll say, something like Richard Dawkins, he is being metaphysically inappropriate. He is taking, uh, uh, he's, he's looking at uh, trying to get mileage for atheism out of evolution. But really, evolution is compatible with a, with a robust theism. And then they can even try going further and saying that uh, intelligent design saddles you with all sorts of problems of evil because then what do you do with parasites and all these nasties that are in nature, you know, then didn't, didn't God design that? And there, there are answers to that. I think, you know, theologically there's a fall. There's also a question of where did these parasites and where these nasties come from? And often it seems that they could devolve or basically, you know, the, way, the, the nature of evil is that it's always parasitic. I think all our words for evil are like that, you know, so deviation, well, it's, Via is the way, so we, we're going off the way. Uh, you know, the Greek notion of sin, homoritano, is uh, to miss the mark. Well, that means there is a mark, and then you've missed it. You know, so there's, uh, but uh, anyway, they, they tend to argue that, you know, you got the science wrong, and we're also better theologically. So, you know, you know boo to you. You know, you got, you got, you, you, got you, you know. For me, the issue is ultimately it's the science. You know, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's a science versus science controversy. And if, if intelligent design doesn't hold up as a science, then you know, then uh, you know, I, I can still be. A, I think I can be a Christian. I might, you know, uh, maybe I would go on the side of the, the biologist people or whatnot. But uh, you know, but I, I just, for me, I'm, I'm completely convinced that intelligent design is on the right track. So, so anyway, so the question was, you know, there's this third. Approach the theistic evolutionists, and that's what I was responding to. So I, I was going to repeat the question, but then I didn't have to do that. So behind Richard, yes. Um, with, with intelligent design came to scholar the gap. How, the, the reason I ask is I, I know he was this one would look at the Milky Way as proof of the existence of the sky goddess Mut, because that apparently was their culture. Um, in, in a similar vein, are we susceptible to that kind of bias that sort of tempted to not only look for patterns in nature, but also to anthropomorphize nature? Um, and how would you account for that bias? Okay, so the question is about does intelligent design commit a god of the gaps, and are we 
simply reading patterns into nature, uh, in a sense, imposing our own biases. I think that's, that's how I'm understanding it. Now, with regard to then this, you know, are we imposing patterns? I think there's, there's a fundamental difference between objectively given patterns and patterns where we are just making it up. I mean, this is, this is the point that Michael Shermer has made, he's a skeptic, I've debated him several times. And he'll say, well, basically, you know, we're programmed by evolution to see uh, patterns and things because that makes us more survivable. Because if we, if we, uh, if we, if we're not paranoid and don't see patterns and things, we're likely to get eaten. You know, so, uh, so to say, we, you know, we, we, we look, and so we, we have this natural tendency to impose patterns. And then I'll give examples like, you know, seeing an image of the Virgin Mary and some burnt toast, or you know. <laughs> and that may be, but uh, you know, uh, what do you do with the, the swastikas in the forest, you know, or somebody who's, who's skywriting, you know, so there are these objectively given patterns, you know, and so I, you know, so I think you, you're not going to be able to get around them. So, you know, God of the gaps, I mean, what, what is a God of the gaps? I mean, so you're looking, there's, there's an explanation, you can't figure out what it is. You know, it's, it's like the, the old, um, uh, who's that cartoonist, you know, it's uh, you know, a scientist on the Sydney Harris, you know, you got a scientist on the chalkboard, uh, you know, some equations and a miracle occurs and then some more equations. And the one scientist says, hey, I think you need to be more explicit there. Okay, so it's like, we've, so basically God of the gaps is it's an argument for idiots. We just don't know what's going on, so we're just going to invoke, invoke God. Yeah. And, I don't, I don't see that. I mean, if uh, these patterns, if they're objectively given, if they've got short descriptions, you know, is it testable that a piece of rock is an arrowhead? Depending on how finely carved it is, I think we can say objectively that's an arrowhead. You know, yeah. we may not know its source. We may not, not know why somebody designed it. I'm told there was a room at the Smithsonian years back that had obviously designed artifacts, but where people didn't know what they did. You know, this is, I mean, th this has been found. I mean, you, you, you know, you look archaeologically, there are things we, we find, we know they're designed, but we don't know what they are. So I don't, I don't think that, you know, I think it's this God of the gaps objection, you know, it, it can be a problem. But it all depends on the merits of the argument being made. And I think you can make it tight enough so that the specification is all probabilities that it becomes very convincing. Uh, Stephen. Uh, I remember you addressing the first day of the book. I was just curious how you, how you deal with it. That's one of those uh, natural processes that give low probability, but high success for identification by submitting some sort of proof. Uh, okay, so what do you do with events is the question that are highly specified, so easily describable, short description, but nature is producing something that is highly improbable also. I think the, the, I think the question then becomes what is the relevant probability distribution? You know, it's not, if it's not, you know, we, we don't, you know, I, I was defaulting to the uniform probability distribution because that was just simple. But what you have to do in a design inference is sweep the field clear of all relevant probability distributions. Now that raises the question, can you do that? The, the critic is always going to say, well, you can't do that because you can't know what all the probability distributions are. But then I would say, we come back and say, yes, but this is an eliminative induction. You do the best you can. If you can identify, you know, that a probability distribution that we missed, bully for you, you know, and then you may defeat a design inference. But it's not that the logic of the design inference is a problem, it's just in light of more information, you may need to change things, you know, but that, that's the nature of scientific inquiry. I mean, that's the whole, you know, if you're Bayesian about science, then you take it as a matter of course that new information can get you to change your probabilities, which is as it should be, right? I mean, it, our theories should be uh, susceptible to new evidence. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, that doesn't mean that we should just say, as a, just 
commit ourselves willy-nilly to a naturalistic view which says, well, we're always going to default to a naturalistic explanation because we just know that it has to be the case regardless of what the probability seems to be telling us. Uh, so this may, may be a question for you. All the design thing, but I've been wondering about the development of a baby. It starts with a fertilized cell, and then it divides and has two and four and a million cells, all with the same DNA. But one cell decides, I'm going to be an arm, and another one says, I'll be a heart or a brain. Does anybody have a theory how those cells know to start that? Well, I think, yeah, I mean, this is developmental biology, and uh, it, it certainly happens. You know, I don't think there is a, <coughs> sorry about that, uh, just, you know, what is the program that, that makes that happen? Do you look in the fertilized cell, initial cell, and say, okay, here is the information that gives us the blueprint for how the development is going to unfold, and we don't know. And uh, uh, you know, I'll just say it. You know, I'm, I tend to be vitalistic on that. I think the information is being put in from outside. I think it's like a radio trans transmitter. But that's that's my view, I mean, and that that's that's not universal with intelligent design. But that's that's uh, because it just seems to me that there are sources of information that we have no clue how they could be materially instantiated. Uh, so I would tend to go vitalistic, but there, there are other intelligent design people who would not go that, that way. But, uh, you know, it's, it, it's an unsolved problem at the very least. Uh, Do the opponents of intelligent design have any other plausible arguments for the, the issue of the origin? You know, the sex of the directed hyperspermia that you showed, I mean, do they have any other explanation? How something came from nothing. Uh, well, I mean, there are biologists are always going to presuppose that we've got physics, chemistry, we've got, we've got a world, a physical world working for us. So it's not out of nothing. But you know, you're going to have to get life from non life. Uh, that's totally unaccounted for. You know, I mean, there, there are scenarios that are out there. But, uh, you know, the thing is, you've got the genetic code. Which is uni universal. I mean, there are variations in it, but I mean, the, the basic, you know, triplet codons, you know, uh, uh, coding for amino acids. That's that's universal, and uh, that's just good. Uh, that's you know, you're, you're not going to. There, there's no uh, accounting for that on materialistic principles. This point, uh, you know, there's people look at self-organizational scenarios and other things, but uh, I find all of that very uh, unsatisfying. The person I actually listen to on that is James Tour. He's at Rice. I mean, he's he's done some very good work in, in debunking the claim that origin the origin of life, a materialistic account of the origin of life, is just around the corner. Um, but then, in the subsequent history of life. Uh, we really don't have anything else going on except the Darwinian mechanism. Everything else, because you know, that's the designer substitute. That's what you need to account for something like a bacterial flagellum. And so, uh, so what I, the, the scenario I sketched out for the bacterial flagellum in terms of the type three secretory system, that's the best they've had. I mean, I, you know, I've, uh, uh, I've been following this for years and years, and it's, uh, the story hasn't changed. It's just they, they have no other options than that. Interestingly, the type 3 secretory system, I mean, it's a poison delivery system, delivers poison into multi celled organisms. Multi celled organisms are, have only been around since the Cambrian. You know, presumably, bacterial flagella have been around you know, as long as single celled, or at least you know, predate the, the arrival of multi celled organisms. So it seems that. The flagellum predates the uh, type 3 secretory system. So, if anything, the type 3 secretory system came about as a result of the bacterial flagellum. It's kind of like, you know, we talked about evolving a motor into a motorcycle. Once you've got a motorcycle, then you can take the motor and run it, and you can run it, maybe as a heater, and you want to fry some eggs or something like 
that. You can do that. <laughs> so, uh, so it's easier to disassemble something than, than strip it, you know, cannibalize it for different, different things. Uh, Darwin evolved. Yeah, Darwin evolves. That's, that's a book by BG. So BG's written many of things, and his, he's worth worth looking at. Uh, his entire corpus over there. Black shirt. Yeah, uh, there you go. Go back to your uh, first slide on specify the question. Um, would another way of looking at that be your category filter with the three points of uh, deep infringement, too complex display, independent specified pattern? And if you could briefly explain the, uh, the deep infringement and how much do you have to be complex and could that you cover knowledge, could that extend out to the design of terms to say this causes your client proven or to say nothing about the impact that causes your client proven or to say uh, biology? Okay, so the question was about explanatory filter. The question I was asking about the um, Filter the old version, which had three uh, decision modes. The, the new one has been actually reduced down to two decision modes, and that's what I had up here just a little while ago. But then the question was also what level of complexity and what level of specificity, if you will, to, to get to a uh, convincing design inference. So uh, the filter is just, in a sense, it's a rational reconstruction of specify complexity. It's, it's a way of just trying to make sense of it in a user-friendly way. Uh, the old filter, the reason I uh, had a node for contingency is that I wanted to treat necessity and chance in a different way. Necessity is something has to happen or it doesn't happen. Chance, if it's contingent, then you can say, okay, is there a probability that it would happen? So it's, there's a probability of it, happening, yes, it could, or it, or, or it didn't. So it's not, if you will, uh, zero, one. It's not definite or, or, or one way or the other. So necessity, in a sense, then, becomes a special case of chance where the probability is always zero, one. You know, if I've got a single, if I've got a double-headed coin, I flip it, it's going to land heads with probability one, that's necessity. So I get rid of the contingency node by simply including necessity under chance. But it's a special form of chance where chance is probability zero or one. Uh, so, but then I think the, you know, the, the question though that you're asking is what level of improbability is enough to eliminate chance also? I mean, you, you, you gotta factor in also the level of description. And this is a slide I uh, omitted, but in a lot of instances, when a pattern is given in advance of an event, we don't really have to concern ourselves with the descriptive length. If you remember this example of, um, of uh, that unbid uh, Mark Kessier would be, you know, this is very hard to describe. This would, this would take a lot of bits to describe it. But once you have it, it specifies what's there. In a sense, it's like it's like a pronoun. I could give you a long, long sentence or something, but then I, then I say it was this, okay? This one, this then becomes a specification for this, and we, we, we don't, and I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but you, with pre-specifications, you don't, in a sense, the, the description length just doesn't matter. So then you're just concerned with the, the, the probability. So let me just speak to the question of the, the probability. Um, in practice, we either are concerned with universal probability bounds or local probability bounds. Local probability bounds uh, are the sort that you're concerned about because, let's say you've got a business, you have an online journal, you've got a million users, you want your passwords to be secure enough that Nobody trying to hack those passwords is going to be able to do so by chance. So it may be that uh, you know, 15 characters, random characters, is adequate. You know, uh, but you know, let's say you're running not just one uh, one website, but you you've got a super server that's 
running all the magazines in the world. And you want to make sure that nobody is randomly going to get into any of those, uh, those, those uh, magazine subscriptions. Well, then you may have to increase your level of security, which means longer passwords, which are going to be harder to crack. It's going to, take, it's going to be more improbable to crack those. But you're still probably not going to be, you're not going to be wanting a level of improbability that works at the level of the entire universe. At that level, the, the improbability that I have landed on, I landed on it back in uh, 1998 with the design inference, and I, I do it still now. It's a level of improbability of 10 to the minus 150, or about 500 bits of information. And that uh, takes into account the number of elementary particles, about 10 to the 90. The fastest rate at which particles can change their states is the Planck time, and then, <laughs> then the duration of the Lovelace. So, and that's that takes uh, that that gets us there. So it's uh, you know that, that that's something I've cut my teeth on. I've written about it extensively. So we'll just have a look, you know, in the back. So the, the, the question is, how precise does the description have to be? I would say it doesn't have to be that precise. It can be quite brief, so long as it's capturing the event in question and it's still highly improbable. So for instance, um, if you look at random uh, amino acid sequences going with peptide bonds, uh, the vast majority are not going to fold. So, you know, I can give the specification, it folds, okay? Uh, that's a short description, uh, but it char characterizes a very highly improbable event, at least if it's just random, <coughs> random sequences of amino acids, okay? Now, the Darwinist is going to say, well, there, it's, that's not the appropriate probability distribution because we already, we were going to start with some amino acid sequences that are already functional and then we're going to evolve to something else. But if you just, my, 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 I'm just trying to illustrate your point though, you know, with the bacterial flagellum, it is, you know, a bidirectional motor driven propeller. That's a short description, okay, of all the, all the ways of putting together protein parts, how many are answer to that functional description. Very few. Okay, so you get these short descriptions that are very hard to, to achieve by probabilistic means. I, you know, one example I actually went over that I uh, just didn't give it to you, but consider this. Um, royal flush, a pair, okay, poker hands. Okay, there are about 1.3 million poker hands that answer to uh, a pair. No. Uh, there are only four poker hands that answer to royal flush. Royal flush is about one in six hundred, one in seven hundred thousand probability. Uh, I think a pair is maybe one in three, one in four. I don't know. Uh, you know, so it's that you have similar description length, but much smaller probability in one case than the other. If you encounter a royal flush, I mean, it's happened by chance that people have seen royal flushes, but you're going to be much more leery of somebody who gets a royal flush than somebody who gets a, uh, a pair. And it's, I would put it to you, it's for that reason. If the descriptions are short, but the probabilities are much smaller in one case than in the other. So then it all holds together. I mean, it's, uh, it, this, is, this, is, this is ironclad. 
your last question. Yeah. Uh, green sweatshirt, and two devils. Have you ever heard of the world of watchmaker rebuttal to the watchmaker argument? Uh, why don't you run with bias? Because the thing is, you know, Aristotle had a notion that life is always here. The world is eternal, and living things were always in existence. So, however far back to go, there's life. But, I mean, design people, Darwinists, we all agreed that you know, life has not always been on planet Earth. The Earth was too hot and tempestuous in its earliest stages to support life. It calms down about 3.8 billion years ago, and then suddenly, within 100 billion years, 100 million years, boom, there's life. So it's not that we're dealing with a world of life, you know, it's we're, we're dealing with a world that actually seems initially inhospitable to life. That's why something like uh, Francis Crick proposes his directed transformia theory. He's a bright guy, you know, so why, why does he come up with something that seems so far off? Well, it's because problem of life's origin on planet Earth has seemed so difficult to him. So I, I don't really see where, you know, the world of, of watches, well, you know, I mean, that's, that's an interesting sort of thought experiment that I don't think there's any, there's any resemblance to what we're really dealing with with the arguments here. I don't mean to be dismissive, but, you know, I, that's just how I see it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, the Miller-Urey experiment in the 1950s, and then I mean, this is, you know, prebiotic simulation experiments. I mean, it's, it, this is work that's ongoing. You try to imitate what the early Earth was like. Uh, you know, I think there's some debate about what those actual conditions were. You know, was it oxidated? Because if there's oxygen, that makes it much less likely that life as we know it could form. And it does seem that there was oxygen early on, but you know, so then there's a lot of speculation about what those early conditions might have been. But even when you run these experiments, what you do is you get building blocks, you know. So I mean I can give you the building blocks for a house, you know, the concrete, the conduit, the wires, you know, all the, the bricks, the shingles, and all of that, but it still needs to be put together. And that's uh, that's that's the challenge. So even if you get the building blocks and you know, the, the experiments that I've seen, you don't even get the building blocks in a form that is usable, you know. So I think with the amino acids that you get out of the Miller-Urey experiment, they're usually in the form of TARs that are bio, not bioavailable. So it's, uh, you know, so I'm not sure where you're coming from, if you're actually on my side or if you're on the other side you know, <laughs> on this, you know. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, when, when you said that, you know, but yeah, you, 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 you know, you, you don't have the complexity, it, it seems like that. Probably are about out of time here. Okay, I mean, I'm, I can go, I can keep going. So if people want to, you know, if you want to, it's, it's, it's your, your call, you know. Or if you, maybe you want to just give people an opportunity to leave, you know, 
know, so you can leave without uh, feeling like you're, you're being rude. <laughs> <laughs> just keep, keep going a little bit, yeah. Sean, I mean, are you good with this, Alan? Because yeah, that's fine. If you're okay yeah. going that far, yeah, I don't should want to be awkward. Yeah. If people need to leave, then you know, head on yeah. out. Should we go ahead and stop the live stream? Okay. Should I go ahead and just cut the live stream?
And he's on an event, you know, with all well, within a range of probability distribution that could happen. Uh, and but it's where where I think it would cause us to raise our eyebrows and look for intelligent design is in the coordination of all these quantum events so to lead to you know for self, you know. And we probably then regard that as a miracle, you know, but in terms of the underlying causality, there need be nothing that violates any law of physics. So it's uh, so I, I don't think there's uh, you know it's not like oh you've got to get a miracle. You know? <laughs> and it, it, can, it can happen in a way, but you know, but it's but at the end of the day, when you see that information, when you see the uh, the swastika in the forest, you know, you know that something. I mean, was there any violation of natural law? No. These uh, these uh, these Nazi youth decided to plant these trees in a certain way, and you know, it's there's, there's no violation. Of but at the end of the day, we know that this cannot be accounted for in terms of uh, anything other than intelligent design. I mean, it's, it's, not a, you know, it's intelligent in the sense that there's an intelligent agent. To say that it's intelligent design doesn't mean it's optimal and that it's good. Uh, but it is, there is, there is an intelligence there. So, I think yeah, you can see this rock here, it's kind of up and on. Then you see this other rock in here, Tom Love Mary. So we go and immediately we know well, that was designed. Right? But now when the Klingons come down that don't know any English, they see these things and they're like, well, looks kind of like a language, you know. Uh, so their their assessment of probability is going to be different than ours. We're going to know for sure this time. They're going to see these marks. So, and then if they're not quite smart enough, they'll just think they're just chips in the, in the rock. So, how does your complexity mathematically deal with the observer that's also going to influence the probability based on their knowledge? Okay, so the question is we've got a rock that is just a rock, and we've got a rock that has John Wilkes Mary written on it. Klingons come and they look at them and they see really, you know, it looks like it could be writing, but there's nothing that really clues them in that it's designed. And so the question is, well, uh, is one going to be more improbable or, or whatnot? And I don't think the probability is so much the question. Both rocks are going to be highly improbable, but there's a question of is there going to be a short description? And if they don't have a knowledge of our alphabet, of the language, you know, if they don't have a sense of the regularity of these uh, of these characters, uh, these alphabetic characters, uh, and what might be involved in their production, uh, they're not going to have a short description for either. And I think that's where the problem comes in. So you're going to have the the the, the improbability is going to be comparable between the two rocks, but it's that you're not in one case. Klingons are not going to have a short description. We would. Okay, but that's just a feature assessed by complexity. You need to know something. You need to be able to form a description. You need to have a grasp of the language and then be able to come up with a short description. If you don't see it, you won't draw a design inference. I mean, it's, uh, you know, let me just, uh, since I've got you all here, uh, this is an example I give, which I think is relevant. So, uh, what do you see here? Just uh, and don't blur it out if you do. Okay. How many, you know, if you look at this and if you don't see what a pattern, an objectively real pattern that's there, you might say that this is a random ink blot. Otherwise, uh, you'll know that it's not. So, how many see what the pattern there is? Okay, so now in Iowa farm country, it's a lot more people who see it. Okay, so this is a cow. So now you've seen this, right? <laughs> okay, you will never unsee this again. Is it is it random? You know, this is this is the point with randomness and, and non-randomness. 
Randomness is always a provisional category. We may see the pattern that tells us that it is designed. And I think, you know, if, if you will, from God's perspective, everything is designed because he sees the patterns of everything that we need. But from our perspective, you know, there are things that we know to be designed, we know that's to be designed, and there are things we don't know to be designed. So in a sense, you know, everything might be designed, but where we can draw the design inference depends on is there a probability we have a short description? And that's what you need before it. What's the short description? It's a cow. That's a short description. Yeah. I'm curious about the time of specified this complexity of a novel in the middle of the background of the middle. Once one is specified the description, chances are Yeah, I think the, the specification, I mean, if anything, the, the, the description may go become shorter. You know, we, we may, because usually we, we don't find the very shortest description, but if we get something that's short, that's good enough because it's, we're, we're subtracting. So, you know, we're trying to maximize specified complexity. So the only other term then is the probability of that event. Yeah. Is that probability of the event affected by one's understanding? One measure of actually saying I understand it better is something that we that specify complexity to shrink. But if I shrink to a certain minimum, that's not uh, I don't quite see it that way because I mean what, what, you know I, I think you're you're absolutely right with the description, but it seems what we want to do with you know, is more knowledge going to always decrease the, the probability. And I would say that need not be the case. You know, I mean, it, it could happen, you know, but I mean, ideally we're going to know what we're dealing with in the first place. Now, the thing is, a lot of the probabilities, it seems, that are relevant in biology are indeed uniform probabilities, equal probabilities, because if you look at, for instance, the genetic code, the DNA, you know, the nucleotides are along a sugar phosphate backbone. They do not affect each other. You know, so, you know, to have an A, T, C, G, you know, if you got an A, it can be anything else the next one, anything else the next one. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the structure of the DNA, it seems, is conformable to this sort of uh, equi probability. I mean, that's, that's what it seems to, it, it naturally uh, lends itself to. Now, it may be that we need to change the probabilities, but you know, ideally when we draw this on inference, we want to, as I've said before, sweep the field clear of all the relevant probabilities. So we want to be, we want to have a good idea of the range of probabilities that could be applicable. And for some of the best work being done by uh, intelligent design people, such as Doug Axe, I mean, what he's going to do is he's going to look at, he's going to run simulations of uh, evolution under Darwinian pressures and then see what the probabilities are there. So we're, we're going to try to be faithful to what the actual probabilities are, not just say, okay, you know, these are the probabilities we can calculate, so let's just use them. You know, so you want, you want to, you want to, you know, the, these methods, you've, you've got to get a handle on the probabilities that actually are in play. Uh, you know, but, uh, but, you know, the, the flip side is, you know, the, 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 the evolutionists tend to poo poo these small probability arguments as though they're not applicable. But then they, they'll flip it where if some system develops reliably under certain uh, selection pressures, so you knock something, some, something out, uh, and but there's a, 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 some sort of precursor form available, and then you run selection pressure, and then you somehow recover it. And you do that over and over again. Well, that's with high probability that selection is working in your favor. Okay, and so they will tout that as power of natural selection. But, you know, if high probability can support your theory, then don't play it both ways. The low probability, if you're going to be fair about it, has to be able to uh, undercut your theory also. Otherwise, you're not in conversation.
conversation with actual evidence. You're, you're just you're just pushing a, an agenda at that point. So, okay, I'm gonna try to ask a good question, but I don't know if I can word it very well. So okay. I'm gonna work through it. So my question is, I'll talk about like an example, but I hope it lands. Like I hope people understand it. There's a YouTube video of a football game, like European football, soccer, essentially. And in the crowd, they're cheering. And they're cheering ambiguous words. And there's a list, like edited a list of potential phrases that you can look at and hear the cheering. So the cheering is like da 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 da. And then it has a list. It says something like Bart Simpson, embarrassing. And then it says lobsters in charity. And it says ambulance uh, coming clearly. But what happens is the ambiguous screaming, when you look at the words, you hear the words from the screaming. So what my question is, is but there's several lists of words. And when you look at these words, you hear the words. When you look at these words that are different, you hear the words. So my question is, um, we're, we have the capability of recognizing patterns that aren't there. Now, I know that before the question was asked, uh, how do you distinguish specific patterns from other patterns? You said that they were objective patterns. But objectivity is the, uh, it is existence without a perceiving mind. We don't have the ability to see objective things because we're subjects. We have no ability of ascertaining what is objective because we're always going to be seeing things from the human perspective. That's the subject that we are. So there is no way of escaping our subjectivity. Is that an objective or a subjective statement right now? No. Is the idea that we're, we're incapable well, I mean, of escaping uh, our you know, subjectivity? What you're saying, I mean, you're, you know, the sort of rank subjectivity that you're arguing for, it seems that you're putting it forward as an objective statement. Yeah. And if, it's, if it's a subjective statement, then, you know, well, I've got my own subjectivity in that case. I don't, you know, I don't mean to be cutesy about it, but this is standard sort of philosophical mm -hmm. stuff, you know, moves. But, uh, but I think, you know, I, and I think I'm going to so let me continue and I want to give you, give you a chance. Uh, but, you know, I think you raise an interesting point about, you know, sort of priming, uh, you know, and, you know, even your point about objectivity. These arguments, just by complexity, they are language relative. You know, it is humans that are drawing these design inferences. It depends on our background knowledge. So there is an element of subjectivity there, you know, and, and that's why I said, you know, it's being a bit juicy. But, so there is an element of subjectivity, but it is, it is not something that somehow invalidates, you know, or doesn't make it, uh, make these arguments binding, you know, and it seems to me that they, they are. Now, the, the priming effects, I think that's interesting, you know, can you be primed when you'll see things or hear things in a certain way? But these, these questions about whether certain description links are what they are, uh, given certain linguistic conventions, it is what it is. You know, I mean, you, you just, you, you measure how many bits does it take to represent a certain linguistic expression or linguistic description of, of an event. So, the, back my, to you. Okay, I think that's a good point. Uh, it might sound stupid, but I would say that the, the only objective fact is that there are no objective facts or not discernible objective facts from human beings um, just because of the fact that we are subjects. But even past that, we can agree to disagree on that point. But even past that, my question would be, how would a person know if their pattern that they've recognized is wrong? What do you mean by wrong? Like if the pattern that they recognize is them applying it to the world rather than the world actually showing the pattern. Like how would they be able to distinguish it objectively existing or it be a subjective inference from their personal biases? I'm finding sure a pattern that's, that's not there. The inference, right? Are you asking just how can you falsify the inference? So I'll try to try to run it by one more time. So let's say that there's a pattern on the wall that I perceive. How do I know that it's not a perception that is because of my socialization and like my in inherent biases versus it just being an objective pattern that's on the wall? How do I know that I'm not just Essentially, drawing the circle. Yeah, just ask other people. Drawing the Well, I mean, yeah, this is. I mean, you know, if, if you're if you're not going to go with objective, then I think you're, you're going to have to go intersubjective. I mean, you know, you're, otherwise you're going to be solipsistic, right? And then I assume you're not going to really go that route. So then, uh, you know, you know the, uh, you know, did you see the cow? Not until you showed me. 
Do you see the cow? Do you see the cow? You know, it seems like we all saw the cow, you know, so, uh, so it's there, you know. I mean, somebody may say, oh, I don't see the cow. Well, let me point it out to you. And, you know, it's, so there's, there's a cow, you know, and once we agree on that, it seems then the inference goes too. Now, you know, maybe there's something even clearer there, you know, maybe it's really, you know, Steve Martin, you know, with an arrow through his head, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're just missing that, and that's even clearer, you know, but, uh, but at this point, that's what we're seeing, you know, it's, uh, you know, there are lots of ways of applying ink to paper, uh, and most of those don't seem to lead to a cow. You know, you, you, know, you can probably now with image analyzers, uh, large, you know, uh, image generation AI, you can probably run it through. So one follow-up. Yes, yeah, so I don't want to be too nitpicky, but with the the conclusion of intersubjectivity, like there was also a point in time where the uh, majority of scientists intersubjectively believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. So just because multiple people or everyone agrees doesn't mean it's actually objective. So I don't I don't want to be too nitpicky because I feel like this will like end up on like some really fringe philosophical things that are probably not smart enough to comprehend. But that was just another point that I wanted to make. Yeah, well, I think the issue let's, let's just call it the issue is truth, right? And you know, intersubjectivity doesn't guarantee truth. I and mean, people can agree, you know, truth is not decided by a majority vote. Okay, but you know, you can do the best we can, and people get things wrong. And then, but science improves because uh, of revolutions in thinking, new ideas that are more powerful. And I mean, what, what ended up disproving the earth as the center, you know, it was not just having a new theory, but also a theory then that was more empirically faithful to, you know, what the data of science was showing us. So, uh, you know, so this, I don't think there's any great mystery, you know, I mean, it, science proceeds, you know, we're fallible human beings, uh, and, uh, you know, but I, th I think that what I've described to you fits right in line with mainstream science. There's nothing, you know, I'm not pulling a fast one on you, like asking you to do something that you would never do in any other context. So, yeah. and, so. Maybe one last one, and then we probably should clear the room to... <laughs> What's that? Okay. Um, and try to versus uh, mission. But um, I guess I just kind of want to run by something by you, what you would think or how you would respond to. Uh, like you didn't really talk much. Like they're talking about, they talk about probability of a single thing. You know, like a simple pattern.
organisms and they're like, what are the probabilities of that to develop a thing, like a fin or a, a hand or, or something of that nature? Um, the thing is like, that didn't have to be the outcome. It, it's, it's not like you need it to develop a hand. And they're like, what is the, I know I'm not, Can I, can I jump in? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think I know roughly where you're, yeah. where you're going. Okay, so uh, and, regarding... And like we have organisms that, you know, that did reproduce and like they are, you know, highly, highly random microorganisms. Like you wouldn't, like it, it's like if you're looking at them, it don't necessarily look designed. Um, you're, you're all over the map, so yeah, you know, I'm not going to be able to. Yeah. You, know, I mean, I, you know, this this, this could be a, another hour just going through everything you have to do for you. So well, let's just try to cut cut yeah, through to, yeah. to a few few things. So improbability at the level of the if you will universe. Okay, you've got a lot more opportunities for life to emerge, and it could be different forms of life. It could be silicon based or whatever. Fine. Uh, that's the. The, these questions of improbability, what is, what is the level of improbability that holds at the level of the universe is, uh, is gauged by something we call probabilistic resources. So if you have more opportunities for an event to happen, you can get higher improbability. Uh, so if I give you a coin and give you an hour, you can flip 10 heads in a row. Uh, a million heads in a row, you're probably going to need a long time for that. But you can still do it, okay? Um, <laughs> if, if I wanted to consign you to prison for 10 years on average, then I could have you flip some like 23 heads in a row, or 20, you know. So that if you were flipping every eight hours a day, six days a week, every five seconds a coin toss, you'd be on an average in about 10 years. So it depends what, what, what your probabilistic resources are, you know? And, uh, and those need to be factored in, and I do factor those in. So that's, that's a big part of, of my program. Um, applying the probabilities, you know, what's the probability of a fin or, you know, a particular, well, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I take your point. Things take certain forms, but they might have taken other forms. On the other hand, there are features of life that are necessary for life as such. You can be alive without fins. You can't be alive without DNA. And you do need to explain DNA. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, silicon-based life, you know, it's, it sounds cool. We have no example of that. You know, so it's, uh, so you still need to explain carbon-based life as we know it. And there are improbabilities in, at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to get around them. So, you know, again, design inference is not about showing that everything is designed. If there were one clear instance of design in biology, Darwin would be dead in the water. You know, if we could nail it down, that's all we need. You know, but in fact, it seems that biology is chock full of intelligent design. You know, so I think especially nano engineering inside the cell. I would, you know, ask you to have another look at that BioVisions video, look at the four eight minute one. Uh, but it's, uh, there's the, you know, I think the, the fact that, you know, I'm having to go through these kind of contortions to try to make this seem reasonable when it's, it in fact is the more reasonable option, it's the Darwinian option, that's really crazy. You know, it's the one, I mean, you know, <laughs> wishful speculations. You know, uh, you know, this is, this is what we've come to where that's, you know, intelligent design is, we're the crazy ones. You know? uh, but, you know, this is, we've got our work cut out. So, anyway, with that, Alan, thank you. Reasonable faith. Thank you. <laughs>